So I wanted to start off by showing you um, some, some uh, images of a brand new work that I'm doing, I'm very proud of. It's the third in the series of Busts of Canon. Of course, you're, we're all gonna enjoy the, the second Bust of Canon, which is downstairs. We um, are going with Simone Subal, my gallery, and she's also present here with us today. Um, and um, we just got into Art Basel, which is a solo booth um, statements, and it's a very big deal for me, and I would imagine for also my family who's sitting here. <laughs> so I'm gonna rush through the images, and um, you know, it's still doing the same thing where I'm questioning different um, kinds of canons, and I'm putting myself in these S impossible feminine S-curves, and I'm basically adapting the, uh, the armor of the goddesses that I'm looking at and the, in the antiquities of museums, but I'm affixing it with contemporary garb. Notice the sound-canceling headphones. <laughs> and here we are. I wanted to share a current exhibition that is up at the CAC the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati currently. I was very excited about this show because it was in the Zaha Hadid building in Cincinnati. And when I saw the building, I didn't want to put anything on the walls. So me and the two curators who might be present here tonight um, decided that we would commission a freestanding sculpture, which happens to be this archway. It's the first archway that I've made one of two archways. The main curator, or one of the curators of this exhibition, Ely Barato and I actually have a long-standing friendship, um, and she definitely encouraged me to make a new work, but it was right off the back of a full solo exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum, so I was really exhausted and going through some health issues. So <laughs> here I am kind of like using everything and the kitchen sink, as Kenny Schachter said on the TV show to do my artwork. Um, this is also some work that I did in, in that year, 2021 to 2022. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a work that I've done previously in a smaller iteration um, where I'm unpacking columns which uh, adorn museums and municip municipalities. They, um, the columns are like usually symbols of power. Uh, this particular column is a Corinthian column so I tried to unpack it and like wrap it in um, another kind of power, which is these Kashmiri rugs. And they, go, they come in different iterations. I'm really interested in these really large sculptures such as gateways and columns because they are these kind of like almost ubiquitous large scale sculptures that are everywhere in the world and they always point to empire. And so I think it's interesting for me to play with those silhouettes and try to find ways to build conversations around um, those sculptures. So this exhibition, the Brooklyn Museum exhibition, I Am an Archive, came with a soundtrack. So when you walked into the room, you were able to listen to um, an album that I made with my dear friend, Kaya Fisher. So I'm going to play one of the tracks of this album to you. And not many people have heard it unless you went to the Brooklyn Museum show. And it was up for a year, so shame on all of you who didn't go. <laughs> right? Okay, so hopefully this will play. and then I'll walk through the images with you. I can get back to it. The first bust. That's my real hair. These are disco balls.
collages where I put um, different color therapy color on top of images of me being squished between glass. And works where I was able to uh, use the antiquities of the museum. So there's about nine tracks, and we are slowly putting this album together. So stay tuned. What else do I have? Okay. So this was also a sculpture that was at the Brooklyn Museum, but there are many iterations. It's a two-way mirror. Um, the material itself is called privacy control. Um, you see it on um, city buildings. You see it in weird crime shows on MTV where someone is like, I know you're behind that mirror. But, um, you know, I did these translations of English translations of the last chapters of the Quran. They're very protective um, chapters, and a lot of people in the world have memorized them to heart. And this was the initial iteration I did in 2018 at Simone Sabal Gallery. Um, and it has formed into four panels, two panels, two panels stacked, you know, so on and so forth. I am Muslima. I'm not sure if Leah's here yet because the Amtrak train was late. <laughs> but maybe in spirit. Um, so Participant Inc. in New York City is a nonprofit space. They have currently moved to a new location, which is very exciting. And they gave me my first um, 
solo exhibition in New York, so it was kind of like a cotillion. And this was in 2017. And one of the more remarkable works, apparently, that I did is this piece, this performance endurance piece called Braid Rage, where I learned how to climb, rock climb, and decided that it would be a good idea to make a drawing by climbing myself. So I have done many iterations. I have toured with this exhibition pretty much consistently since 2017. They consist of um, hair and hypothermia blankets and um, wearable chains. They come from the corners of my body and not the curves of my body. Um, our own Hirshhorn owns um, Gorilla Girls, right? And there was that famous poster they made about how there's only a few ways a woman can be a part of an exhibition and one is languidly laying on a painting and the other one is being naked in the room. So for me, I was really interested in also unpacking some of the language in which um, I've learned over time in art history about my positionality in the art world. Climbing as high as I can in a, in a gallery space seemed pretty um, no-brainer for me at the time. And so in 2021, or actually in 2020, the New Orleans Museum of Art asked me to do braid rage during the pandemic, and they then commissioned me to make a film of it, which is um, really exciting because now this work lives often in other forms, and I can continue eating um, sugary treats and <laughs> not have to always be ready to do this practice. Um, and then I also wanted to share with you some small collages, some very like, intimate things I do. I learned um, over the course of many years of making art that I'm very insular at certain parts of the year, and I like to do collages, reading, researching, painting, drawing, and then other parts of the year I like to make the bigger fabrications where I'm working with a lot of people and I'm um, allowing people to have a little more control over my work. I'm, I also love the idea of making custom frames for the collages and the artworks because I've always thought that the frames of a work is also part of the work and doesn't live outside of the work. And when you see these color panels, they're plexiglass, um, they were a way for me to come back to painting. Um, and I just, it wasn't ready yet. And I'm, I'm sort of classically trained as a painter but for years, like say 15 plus years, I didn't paint. Um, it was kind of a, a moment in, in around 2019 and 2020 when I was thinking about therapy through plants and color. And then of course we all had to sit with how to deal with a major pandemic. So that became like very important to me. So I started to learn how these different colors can help you think through different things. And that's kind of when you see these moves with the different um, panels of plexiglass, that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm healing the archive. Okay, works in progress. So I am about three days away from installing my first public art exhibition. Um, in New York City on the High Line, and this will also be up for a year. Um, I love the idea of just giving people time. So you take your time, and it'll be there for you. It will be up at the, um, close by the Standard Hotel. There's an elevator right next to it, which was important to me as well. I'm going to read what this work is about. It's called The Painful Arc, number two, shoulder high. It's a public art commission for the High Line, supported by the Douglas Residential College at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, and Simone Sabal Gallery, and several private contributors. This is a 15-foot archway, 
and it will, again, stay up until June 2024. The medical term painful art characterizes severe pain in one's shoulder due to repetitive work or shifting bone structure. During 2020 and 2021, the left side of my body was shifting to make space for a large ovarian cyst. What is that? Nobody knows. The architecture of my posture was slipping away. I control this medical issue by weight training like an athlete. This work applies to my physical experience to an architectural site. As I learn to square my shoulders and become more experienced in the geometries of my own body's design, I remember the work of Robert Morris. Bless his heart. The minimalist artist simply says, and simply does, similar things to my project. Made colossal sculptures in the likenesses of his own shoulders. So why don't I? The painful arc, shoulder high, is made with a solid surface corion inscribed by shipping boxes that provide resources to keep the ecosystem of the park alive. The arc presents invisible labor that goes into the care and protection of the Highline Park. So all the boxes come from multiple conversations I had with all the department heads of the entire park. Whether it be pig, guess what pig is? I'll tell you. The pig is um, a filtration company, air filtration company, right? We all know who Mr. Clean is. And then, you know, you have all these different departments, horticulture, commissary, what have you. And then the emblems is a late aster, which you find on the High Line. And it's my favorite flower. So I hope that the visitors can feel the weight of the painful arc while also understanding the weightlessness in some ways, we need to know our history, but at the same time, we can let it go. We don't need our histories to define us. So lastly, I wanna share one more work with you. It's a body of work. It's a new body of work. They are going back to the oil paintings um, that I once did, thinking through these years of working with color therapy and um, acrylic planes on my collages, I decided to go for it and actually make some oil paintings. So this series is called Grand Trines because I'm looking at my astrological zodiac signs. It's very woo-woo. But I'm also unpacking the flora and fauna of Kashmir. So let me just quickly read this and then we can um, move on to the next agenda. I'll let you see that, that's prettier. This new body of work explores the pleasurable medium of oil painting. I translate the craft of walnut wood carvings in Kashmir into oil paintings on walnut panels. Kashmir has one of the largest walnut tree populations in the world and distributes the material widely. Once considered the Paris of Asia, Kashmir is now known only for its resources, craft, and religious conservative governance. Its people fight for sovereignty under the curfews and shrouded legendary romantic histories. Imagine if Paris, France, was no longer the Mecca of love. What would happen to the psychology of its people over time? I grafted vectors from my natal chart, which is an astrological chart, as the last layer on top of these paintings and wonder about this historical erasure. It's people living only in the mythologies of Kashmiri gardens and largesse. The geometries of my astrological chart Will alter the views that are the will alter the views state the viewers. Jeez, this did not happen on the TV show. <laughs> Let me start that sentence over again. <laughs> you guys are great. The geometries of my astrological <laughs> the geometries of my astrological chart will alter the views 
the, the viewer's state of consciousness to abstract the flora and the translations and to imagine oneself tangled into the thick patterns that you see before you. I'm looking into the Tantra meditation non-paintings of the 17th century in Rajasthan, and I'm revisiting the textiles from Rajasthan and Kashmir in my performative works, I Have Arrived. These, okay? So these are actually materials that I picked up in 2017 when I was with my mom in, in Rajasthan. And these rugs were made with me and some craftspeople in Kashmir. And what I've done is I've pushed myself against glass, a 12 foot ceiling of glass, and created a body scanner to show the gravity of my weight, but also weightlessness. Okay? So, that work is called I Have Arrived in a Place with a High Level of Psychic Distress. I Have Arrived, the geometries of color acrylic planes were applied over a photographic print as a healing mechanism, possessing uncanny affinities to the Tantra non-paintings, are actually a range of 20th century abstract painters such as Hilma Off Klimt, Wassily Kandinsky, and Kazimir Malevich. And I am enjoying revisiting that work while I am painting and working on this ongoing series. Walnut carvers, mostly men, cut high relief flora and fauna into tabletops, screens, boxes, and wall hangings. The political conflict Forcing repressed desire to maintain religious piety in Kashmir reminds me of the Shakers, religious beliefs who employed purity and non-sexual eroticism only to be fulfilled in projects and obsessions of handmade crafts. Mostly hovering above the cut surfaces, walnut carvers spend their time chipping away, looking down into wooden ponds of desire, perhaps turning themselves into Nargis, a narcissist flower. Flowers are a symbol of multiplicity and a sign of fertility. These carved flowers, calligraphic leaves, and twisted stems read very Baroque, so fecund and full of creative energy. I turn to the text also of Virginia Woolf sitting in her garden, left jealous Witnessing the freeness of bees pollinating and plants copulating, oozing from the ground. Wolf was held captive from her desires of love unfulfilled, but instead felt surveilled by the very caretakers that loved her. Love at this time and in these times have a thin veil between desire and surveillance. So that's that. Anyway, these are kind of like weird iPhone photos of the paintings that I'm just working on in my studio. And they're all made from these walnut panels. And there's just gonna be so many of them until I'm bored of doing it. Okay, that's what I got. So I know that, uh, or I imagine many of you have questions for Basira, so I am, we will not talk long. We'll make sure to hand it over and, and have plenty of time for those. But I have three questions okay. uh, that I want to ask you while we're sitting up here. Two of them are my own, and one of them is from a friend. Okay. Um, but first, I, because you did move so quickly over the Liberator, I thought we could take a minute and talk about the work that is installed just around the corner. Which I didn't want to ruin it for you guys. Ruin the surprise. Um, but again, just around the corner, and after this talk, we will all be able to go and experience this work, which is a really complex object, and one in a series of work that Basira has been doing for some time. Um, so talk us through the impetus for the work, the inspiration for the work, and then how the work was made. Okay, so the impetus was feeling uncomfortable with 
my life choices. <laughs> but there's a point to that story. Um, it's an interesting place to be an artist in this, in this world because we have the opportunity to both kind of put our toes in both sides. We get to engage in the aesthetics, we get to you know, have the, have the kind of like culture and be at the museums and galleries, but then we also go home and try to, try to get some sleep at night knowing that a lot of the museums have borrowed sculptures in their possessions. Um, and, you know, a lot of artists who um, kind of were unseen as they were alive are being celebrated in their wake. And so um, I thought that I would look into the antiquities of museums worldwide, and I started to see myself in the deities of some of the particular sculptures I'm looking at from the Met, from the Smithsonian, from the Brooklyn Museum. Um, and so I was particularly interested in the impossible S-curve and thinking through the fact that we are being asked to do so much with our bodies and give so much of ourselves in order for us to keep our jobs. Because, you know, a lot of you in here probably feel like if you don't have social media, then you're not, you, then the trees don't fall in the forest. So um, this kind of pressure is, is new, it's, it, and we're unpacking it as a society. And so I had the privilege of being able to do that with this, these three sculptures. Um, and what was the antiquity that you selected as the inspiration for the sculpture, the Liberator, that's, yeah, that's here now? The sculpture, I believe, is a Nepalese um, deity, and it's a narrow dakini, mm -hmm. but it's one of many. It just so happens that the Smithsonian has one of the more particular pieces, and I kind of deconstructed the bridge part of it and turned it into the slice of the body. Mm -hmm. What was appealing to you about the character that is portrayed in that figure? Mm -hmm. so the certain deities that I am, am working with, just kind of like, there's always magic in the room. So at the time when I was looking at this particular antiquity, uh, there was a lot happening in Texas around readjusting laws and policies that would influence families, particularly women, and their rights to their own body, right? And Texas being where you grew up as Texas well, right? being where I grew up. And then that kind of spilled into the rest of America and the world, because America is the center of the world. <laughs> um, you heard it here first. <laughs> in DC. <laughs> so I... Um, I became very interested in unpacking the narrow dakini because it is a feminine sculpture that that their life was dedicated to liberating um, the feminine creative energy, and that can be in anyone. It's not a gender thing, and they will basically slice anybody who gets in the way. <laughs> um, and so the the, the kind of um, you know altercation that you see in the sculpture down the stairs is just sort of mid-fight, kind of being sliced open, and you know, there's a lot of adversarial things that happen to anybody who wants to uh, make things right, so. So the figure is, is a warrior who fights for women, right? Um, and you put your, can you talk a little bit about how you made the work, how the work was constructed, because mm -hmm. you place yourself at the center of this sort of yeah. reimagining of the, of the figure? I know a lot of you were probably feeling a little vertigo because I've done a lot of different kind of work. Like, oh, she's making collages. Oh, now there's painting. No, no, there's sculpture. What is happening? What is this person doing? Um, but really, at the, at the end of the day, what I'm really interested in is thinking about how most of us in the world are sitting in between the camp of desire and the camp of surveillance. And it's kind of like a cop out for me to say that because it's like the haves and the have nots. It's like the master and the bondage of the slave. You know, these kinds of dualities have cropped up 
specifically in the art world, in, in theory, but also in just like the way that we've created sovereignty for ourselves. Like we're not in the feudal system anymore, right? So here I think that technology really is doing two things. It is creating desire and, and fulfilling the desire train, but it's also taking our data and manipulating us through algorithms and, you know, sending cute little drones that look like cats to other countries and then they, you know, aren't cats, they're bombs. Um, so I think that the, the sculpture made sense to me because um, a lot of people who are athletes and who um, work in the desire industries make 3D portraits of themselves, even Jeff Koons. So I peeped this place in Bushwick where Mike Tyson and Jeff Koons had just made prints of their bodies. So, of course I was gonna do that too. Um, and then from that idea, I started to build the layers and layers and layers uh, and the kitchen sink <laughs> on top of that to then culminate into the first sculpture which was presented at the Brooklyn Museum. And the song that you heard is one of nine songs that sits in the chest of that sculpture. Um, but then, you know, I wanted to do three sculptures. We, I did want to do three sculptures for the Brooklyn Museum. But then, you know, my dealer and like my friends and my family and everyone was like, just, just, just chill. <laughs> you'll, you'll have another show one day. <laughs> And so um, this is like something that was already on my mind. I wanted to do uh, kind of an, a sculpture that felt like it was in motion, but then the TV show happened. We didn't know actually that we were supposed to go home and then come up with some crazy exhibition for a competition. We, we didn't know anything when we, when we came into the show, by the way. We didn't know anything. <laughs> Okay, so you guys duped us. Um, so, you know, I, I get back to my studio after, the, after we taped in Baltimore and finding out I'm one of the three people who can come to the Hirshhorn. And I was like, well, God's always playing jokes because I did want to come to the Hirshhorn, but I didn't know I was going to come like this. Um, so instead of rethinking a completely new idea, I oftentimes work in series because one work isn't enough. I always like to like make several works so you can kind of see a communication in a family. So it made sense for me to make a new sculpture in that series, Busts of Canon. Which is also based around the a physical 3D scan yes. of your own body that you then manipulate um, in a very specific way way mm -hmm. and adorn with a lock of your own hair and going to the garment district which is really <laughs> i get to do tax write-off on some of the things i wear <laughs> um secret wait i'm at the government <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot i'm gonna get audited <laughs> Okay, well, like you said, we won't give too much of the form away. You can, you can take a look at the object itself around the corner and also on the wall in the gallery where Basira's work lives is a small image of the Naro Dakini figure which inspired the work, so you can sort of get a sense of, of that narrative in turn. Um, but you, I, second question is, well, questions within questions, but um, is a little bit about the show, but also about your practice, because t you've talked about surveillance, both, you know, as a, as a motif that runs through much, if not all of the work, both in, in ways that we control through social media platforms, for example, and ways that are out of our control completely. Um, so by extension, what ways did the experience of the show feed into your larger practice? Well, <laughs> I, um, I watch a lot of TV and actually it was, a, it was sort of a tradition in our family. The TV was very small, but we had a large appetite. <laughs> um, and then, you know, it's like, I think in 2020 it was, I started working with the kitchen to make a six part series of my own design in a TV show because I was very, it was almost like I was very disturbed by the fact that we were all asked to sit in one place 
in 2020. And there was some conversation around how are we going to pay rent and, and, and our mortgages. But then instead of figuring that out, the world decided we should all have free subscription to HBO <laughs> and, and Netflix and, and, and Hulu, right? So I was really like, these are the ways in which I move through the world of making art. I find something and I can't get over it. And so I unpack it and I unpack it and then I decide, okay, I need to make a work out of this. And so if, you know, 8 billion people, which is our planet, are watching TV right now, and we're all going through the pandemic together, then maybe I should make a TV show because that's the future of art. Um, and it's all going to be virtual, so let's get this done, right? So I... I got with the kitchen and we created a, a, a way to navigate each other safely and we made this amazing show together called By Faith. It's still sitting in my tapes of things to do, but um, it's really through that that I was like working on it and working on it and then I got an email from what I called the blondes because all the producers were blonde, including myself. But... Um, they kind of like, I thought it was spam at first, and then I ignored it, I ignored it, and then at some point I didn't get this grant that I was really close to getting to make more of the show, my show, by faith. And I was so sad, and then I went back to the emails, because you always go back to the clickbait when you're really sad, right? <laughs> <laughs> or you doom scroll or something. This is when you get in trouble. So I went ahead and answered, and then just like every couple of weeks we would just stay in touch we would stay in touch and then I started to like really like them and they I just kept saying yes to every step that they wanted me to take right into the clutches of <laughs> Melissa <laughs> at the church <Hirschhorn. laughs> but yeah I'm glad I did it and that's kind of yeah. that's kind of I don't remember the question but well, there you go <laughs> but irrelevant irrelevant um so I will ask one more question and then we'll turn it over to you so now is the cue to get ready but this is a question uh that I got from a new friend Gabby right before this talk started Gabby is 13 um and Hi, she Gabby. watched every episode of the show uh okay. and she had a question for you which I think is a great one and what other artists have you been most inspired by throughout the beginning of your work and, and until now? Oh, man. Okay, Gabby. Can I call you Gabby? <laughs> um, last night, I was weird full circle. I was invited to the kitchen to um, celebrate Sangin Naguti who is this amazing performance artist, sculptor, performer, writer, person. We have a work on view on the third floor, so come back to the Hirshhorn. And yes, and maybe you can't see it tonight. Sorry. Okay, you can't <laughs> see it tonight. Don't see it tonight, unless you want to get in trouble. <laughs> but, you know, weirdly enough, my family over here, this part of it anyway, had come to Colorado Springs to watch me do Braid Rage, which we have all seen. And it was very important for me because it was really the first time I had shown in any other part of the world other than Texas and New York. And so I'm here in Colorado Springs. And I realized that Sangin Nanguti lives here. She built a life in Colorado Springs uh, around the like 80s. She left New York and just went there and just built this life. And so I would like call and try to make emails and like she's very secretive but I was so sad because I never really got to reach out to her and I really wanted her to see the performance so here I am climbing and then my the ropes twist and then I actually see everyone in the audience and my nephew Yusuf goes why is puppy hanging upside down <laughs> I remember that question and then the other thing I saw was Sangin Naguti in the audience. And I basically, like, what I do, I'm actually, I was just telling Melissa this earlier, I'm actually a really shy person. And there's a lot of, like, fiery hoops and anxiety going on inside, but I don't have a whole lot of expression in my face because then I'm an Aquarian. 
But, you know, at the end of the day, I have these outer body kind of experiences. I don't know how I train myself to do that, but I almost broke my like performance space and just would have started laughing and the whole thing would have gotten ruined by, by that turn. But, you know, she's just been amazing. I've seen her work in Munich. I've, I've like, I've, uh, helped friends curate her into and make books. And I'm just, what is it about her work and the way she approaches her work that is inspiring to you? I think that, um, well, I grew up in Texas around a lot of oil money and land, and basically the Bauhaus movement happened in Texas, apparently, because every single curator and every single art, artist with a capital A has their work there um, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And so I grew up with a lot of pressure, like, how could I be an artist? How can I make this, you know, three floor metal sculpture out of, you know, working on a waffle truck or whatever I do, you know, how do I do this work? So I, um, when I started to learn about artists like Marin Hassinger and, and Sangin and Guti and, you know, just other artists, I, I learned that you, it's okay to make small gestures mm -hmm. and it's okay to make art about what's in your environment and it's okay to just kind of not make art too, you know? Yeah. So that was kind of what inspired me about oh, her. That's lovely. It's an inspiring note for all of us. Okay, who has a question? We have a mic that we're passing around. Hi. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Um, uh, I just, just wanted to say I love your art so much and you've been such an inspiration and I've loved seeing you on the exhibit and I hunted down the narrow Dikini sculpture after you mentioned in the show. Anyway, question. Um, so thinking back to when you very first started to like get interested in art, like even if you can't remember, the first thing you remember being inspired by art and like wanting to pursue that journey, what is one... What is one piece of advice you would give to that younger self of how to go on that journey? You really have to not think. <laughs> because the thinking part is what tells you not to do it. That's, that's, that's the only trick to anything. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to get there. But. <laughs> yeah. but I thought your question at first was going to be, what was your first artwork and inspiration? And it was actually the Garfield comics. Because <laughs> my brother Aleem would go to the library and get all these Garfield comic books. And I was like, I want to look at them too. And then he wouldn't let me look at them. So I would start to copy the comics and alter them. And that's also how I learned about Abu Dhabi because there was a cat named Nermal that came into the household and Garfield did not like Nermal. And so he put her in a FedEx box and mailed her to Abu Dhabi. It's brutal. I know. But that's how I learned about global politics, you know? Uh, I think we have time for one or two more. Is anybody else in the back there, it looks like? Hi, Batira, how are you? Um, I really don't have a question, but I just wanted to say that I did watch the show, and out of the artists, I just felt like I had such a connection to your story, and I felt like your art was so indicative of your life experience and just paying attention to life as it's moving around you. And so I just really appreciated that about you. And I was very inspired. And I really just started doing art actually during the pandemic. I found art during a very low, low period of my life. And it just kind of like saved me. I wasn't doing it to do art. I was just kind of like messing around. So after seeing the show, I just felt like, you know, it really changed my perspective on what art is. It's just really an outward expression of how you feel about life moving around you. And I was very inspired by your, by your appearance on the show, and I was rooting for you, so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, we'll take one more, but then we can all go outside and talk more together while we go and appreciate the liberator. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I was Hi. also watching you on the show, and um, I'm, I'm into your art. I, I think I really appreciate your approach to your art. Um, and you may have answered this previously by saying, like, just don't think about it, but you you center yourself in a lot of your work, and you just, like, throw your body on a scanner or, like, <laughs> you know, go 3D print me. Like, how do you do that in a way that doesn't feel like narcissistic or self-centered? Like, how do you find a way to bring yourself to the center of your work? Well, we do live in a very narcissistic <laughs> society. We're all narcissists. Um, well, I'm a, I, I, I didn't know how to suss out the part of my practice that's performance um, on, on such a small scale, right? So we had a lot of art supplies but a lot of what I think through is performance, the performativity of material or myself. So, you know, when I was thinking about scanning myself, I was thinking about um, how the scanner itself is sort of a weaponized tool. And so, um, you know, I don't know how to, to introduce other people into my practice because I'm so afraid of exploiting people but somehow I'm I, I guess on some level I'm willing to exploit parts of myself but I w over time I realized that like that mentality sometimes accidentally exploits different people and different parts of things that you never even intended and so you know it's it's like a um you know I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this last part with a little bit of a joke, but when I was in my teen years, when going growing pains, like 13, 14 years old, one of my arms was longer than the other arm. And I looked really ugly, like hair, follicles all over the place and pimples. I was just fugly. <laughs> and now I'm a beautiful butterfly. <laughs> But I think that that's what I'm going through. Like, I think that my artwork isn't perfect and it doesn't have to be because it's exploration. And again, like, I, I turn my brain off and I just go with my gut. And I have a feeling that there's something here. And so I want to I wanna feel that out. I want to suss that out. But in doing so, I, I'm trying to think light years ahead of like, okay, I don't want to make this person feel uncomfortable or this person feel uncomfortable. So using my body as a site is really important to me. And I don't think of myself as me. I've kind of given myself up like Prince. I'm just an idea. <laughs> that is, okay, we'll end here. Please. <laughs> <laughs>